This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. So, given the Mary, Perry, and David Z's jokes and explorations of the lessons in Unscripted, I was seriously tempted to title this sermon, The Many Questions of David Z. <laughs> but you, you left one out, Dave. I, was, I noticed when I was um, reading the, the gospel today, the one question that I do not have an answer for and that you did not raise was, where did they get the 12 baskets? No answer. Uh, <laughs> anyway, somewhere, Dave, somewhere, somewhere today, someone is preaching on the meaning of there was much grass in that place, linking it to the 23rd Psalm and where the shepherd leads his sheep to the green pastures, but it isn't me. Somewhere, Dave, somewhere today, someone is preaching on the storms of life and how we should let Jesus into our boat, because that preaches, but it isn't me. Somewhere, Dave, somewhere today, someone is preaching on why Jesus was testing the disciples and linking it to how God tested the Israelites in the wilderness and how God tests us to deepen our faith. But it isn't me. Somewhere today, someone is preaching on the Eucharistic meaning of the feeding of the 5,000. I mean, you can see how deep and rich this passage is. In fact, the church in its wisdom considers John chapter 6 so important that we are going to spend five weeks in this chapter reading it in the gospel. I'm not going to be with you five weeks. I'm only going to get the first three of those five, um, which is why we'll be talking about the meaning of the feeding of the 5,000 in the next two weeks, because otherwise I wouldn't have anything to preach on. Okay? So... I think that's taking care of most of your questions, right? Okay. So just a little bit of background. John chapter 5. Jesus heals the paralytic laying by the pool of Bethesda. And there follows this whole discussion with the Jewish leaders about why he did this on a Sabbath. You know, that kind of ticked him off. And then Jesus starts talking and it's this whole keynote address about who he is and how he goes on about how he and the Father are one. And you thought healing on the Sabbath ticked off the Jewish leader. When he starts talking about how he and the Father are one and, and things like the Father gives life and so does the Son. And he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. You know that really even made them even angrier. And so he ends this whole these are the witnesses to who I am. And he lists the witnesses, John the Baptist, the, his word, his deeds, the father. I mean, he's got four witnesses. You know, Hebrew law says you have to have two. He's got four. He goes, but if, if you, I mean, he says, if you believed Moses who wrote about me, you would believe my words. But clearly you're not believing my words. So clearly you're not really believing Moses. It's this flashpoint address about who he is. Who is this guy? So chapter 6, following right after it, becomes the living parable, this huge scale dramatic act revealing just who Jesus is, backing up and confirming everything he said right before this. So in answer to Mary's question, why do we have two miracles in the same reading? Actually, we've got three. Uh, it's because if we separate them, we don't see the large living dramatic sign. So that's why we have the two together the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water because the two of them together make the Passover event. How do we know it's a Passover event? John tells us the Passover was near. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near and Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great multitude coming. That great multitude is, is how the people of Israel leaving Egypt are described, the great multitude. So because the Last Supper is a, not only a Passover event, but the Passover event, it's very easy for us as, as Christians to 
understand and hear this feeding of the 5,000 as God providing in the wilderness and as the Hebrews in Egypt eating the bread in haste. And because we say every Sunday, Christ our Passover sacrificed for us, it's very easy for us to, to, to immediately see in this feeding the 5,000, it's easy for us to see this is the Lamb of God offering himself. And we'll talk more about that in the next couple of weeks. But, but all of our Eucharistic training prepares us to understand that this is the Passover event, that Jesus is reenacting to explain and prove who he is. And the fact that then Jesus walks on water as if it were dry land really kind of wraps up and confirms the Passover event. It's Moses leading the people through on dry land. Jesus doesn't even bother parting the waters. So let's just walk across, right? So to me, though, it's the third miracle that kind of wraps it all up together as a Passover <coughs> event. He gets in the boat, boom, immediately there, there. They're landed and they're safe. Because the point of walking on the water on dry ground was to save and free God's people from their enemies, the Egyptian army chasing after them. So the point of Jesus walking on the water is not just to catch up to the disciples because he accidentally got left behind, right? It's in order to save the disciples. And so part of what struck me in this lesson was the overarching Passover plan of rescue and how it's mirrored here in the saving of a boat full of disciples. I mean, okay, how many times has God rescued us? <laughs> right? How many times has God rescued us? And how many times after that rescue do we find ourselves in the promised land? Yeah? That is what the Passover is all about. The rest of chapter 6, which you'll spend four more weeks on, is the revealing of the meaning of this dramatic sign, clarifying who Jesus is. Part of what <coughs> Jesus is doing and what John is showing us Jesus is doing is He's trying to correct the Jewish leader's faulty understanding of who God is, of what God's plan is, and of who Jesus is. That misunderstanding, that faulty misunderstanding that revealed itself in the discussions in chapter 5, he said, okay, we got we to gotta fix how you understand it. But we also see Jesus correcting the faulty understanding of the crowd. You know, they see, yeah, he may be Moses, He's trying to help them see he's greater than Moses. He may be king and Messiah, and the crowd sees that, and they, they, they guess that, but they see one level. He's going, no, I need you to go to a deeper level. I need you to understand, have a deeper understanding. And so when they act on their faulty misunderstanding, he withdraws from them. Okay, ever try to force God onto your own agenda? Does it work very well? <laughs> Jesus is trying to take all of the players in this drama <coughs> to a deeper understanding of who he is and what he came to do. And that's the story of being a disciple, that he will constantly be trying to take us to a deeper understanding of who he is, of the big plan of what he's doing, and of the big plan of what he is doing in us. Think back on all the times God rescued you. Was there not a healing element in it where God either corrected a faulty understanding or healed a deeply buried but incorrect belief about yourself, about the world, about God? Those things that because they're embedded in us, we don't even know it because we don't know what it's like to live without that faulty understanding. We don't see it as false until he opens it up and shows it to us. And then we go, oh, thank you, Lord, for healing me. Which is why the real title of this sermon is, He Cracked Me Open Like a Coconut. <laughs> when COVID hit um, and we couldn't be together, my parish, Trinity at Terraville, instituted Zoom morning prayer and evening compline. 
and those Zoom meetings um, services are still going. Now, I don't think we're still meeting in this format because we miss each other, because we're back in church together. Um, and I think the practice of doing the daily office is secondary for most of these participants. The real reason is the prayer time. This is a group of people, most of them invested as intercessors, but they're kind of used to interceding <coughs> on their own. And what they discovered was the power of interceding together on a daily basis. So one of the people we have been praying for over the past year is a man who's been who was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. Um, and he, it did not look good for him. He underwent some very painful treatment and surgery, and we just kept praying and praying. And a few weeks ago, he reported that he was <coughs> in remission. This week, he joined our prayer group. And yesterday, he gave testimony to, what, to the group about what God had been doing in him. It awakened his faith. It introduced him to the whole idea of prayer and intercession because somebody, many people were praying so faithfully for him and he saw the fruit of it and he thought, I, I think God's awakening a call to intercession in him. And it awakened his gratitude and compassion. So here's what he said. God woke me up at 4 a.m. today. I don't know why he couldn't wait until 6, but God woke me up at 4 a.m. today. And he showed me what all of this has meant to my wife and my children. He said, before I was just, you know, what, is, what does this mean to me? How can I use, you know, grab onto God for me? He goes, and all of a sudden it's like I could see what this meant for my wife and my children and how much harder it was for them even than for me. And he goes, he cracked me open like a coconut. And I was clean. That man has been through some pretty rough stuff. And coming out on the other side, he's waking not only to his having received a miracle, he was opened to a wrongful attitude that he didn't even know he had. But the Lord said, I want to deepen and I want to get rid of this wrongful attitude so that more than your body is healed and more than your soul is healed so that your family is healed also. Cracked him open like a coconut, and he set him free. And if that is not an individual Passover event, what is? It was a very uh, full week. Tuesday night at church, we held a come and be refreshed and or renewed and or meet the Holy Spirit for the first time meeting. And it wasn't so much a teaching session on how to be baptized in the Spirit, and it wasn't even a session of laying on of hands. It was a session, it was a night of um, learning how to be still in the presence of God so that the Holy Spirit could come and do whatever work the Holy Spirit wanted to do in each person. The presenter did a little bit of teaching, but mostly he was using the Benedictine spiritual practices. And, and you've probably heard of the, the Lectio Divina, where you listen to scripture several times. And he combined that with one of the, the Benedictine practices of identifying with one of the characters as you go along. Um, and, and, and of seeing it kind of enacted as a drama. And as an aside, if you would like um, to experience uh, the power of some of these Benedictine practices. There's an app called Pray As You Go um, that has like a morning meditation combination of music and meditation and um, these Benedictine spiritual practices. It's really wonderful. Uh, so Pray As You Go, it's a free app. So the scripture that, that the presenter used um, for us to... to, to still ourselves and to hear from God was the parable of the prodigal son. And God cracked me open like a coconut. So in the moment when the younger son returns home and kneels down before his father in the fullness of his shame with the whole community gathered around and he looks up and he sees the father's love probably for the first time. Did he understand? Father's love. And in that moment, I was the younger son. 
And there was this flash of God's love. The fullness of God's love just went, just a flash. And in that brief moment, my heart flashed back. I mean, it took my breath away. It's me. I'm the one the Father loves. I'm the one he delights in. I'm the one he rescues. I'm the one seeing the Father's heart of love in this moment. And in that moment, I could, I could just kind of see the shame that I'd been carrying and the, a wrongful thinking that had been buried deep in my soul. Who knows, you know, one, two, three, way down there. The mistaken belief that I was a disappointment to God. Now, I know you look and you go, Julie, that can't be. But it, that's the kind of stuff that's buried in our hearts. Yeah? The belief that I was a disappointment to God. And in that flash of love, it's like flash, reveal, pull, clean, done. Didn't take more than like two seconds. I mean, God's pretty good at this. <laughs> now, this is not the first time God's cracked me open like a coconut. And... I, I expect by the smiles on the faces and the nods of the head that many of you have also been cracked open like coconuts, at least once, if not two or three or four times, because God will do this over and over and over. But it's often the same kind of pattern. We go through something tough. We go through um, some suffering. Uh, we come to the Lord in our pain. Sometimes there's some repentance. Crack, reveal, pluck out, heal. Replacement Healing, part of the healing is the replacement of God's truth. If this is what's wrong and false and he plucks it out, then it's got to be replaced by something that's true. And the truth that God replaced in me this time is that God loves me. Now, this is not a simple, generic, oh, God has to love everybody. God loves you. You know, Jesus, meek and mild, loves you. No, what an insult to God. This is Boom, flash, heart blazing love and power and delight and joy. Which, believe it or not, leads us to our passage in Ephesians. Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father. Paul is interceding for the Ephesians, which is what he's been doing a lot of in the first three chapters. He is just loving and praying for this young church. So this is what he prays for in this passage. He prays that they may be strengthened in their inner being, that Christ may dwell in their hearts, and somewhere, somewhere, somebody today will be preaching on the importance of asking Jesus to dwell in our hearts, and it preaches, but that's not what I'm doing. Okay. Paul prays that they will be deep, deeply rooted and grounded in love and that they would understand the enormity of God's love for them, the breadth and the depth and the height and that they would know that love of Christ was just so brilliant, it's totally beyond our understanding. Why does Paul pray these things? At the end of the passage it says, so that, any time Paul says, so that, that's what you pay attention to. So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. N.T. Wright says that what Paul is praying is that they may discover the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And it starts with knowing God as the all-loving, all-powerful Father. And we put down our roots into that love. We let that love enfold us, folk into us, until it becomes the central force and energy and focus of every thought and action and way of being. And it introduces us to Christ. It leads us to know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then God can take that brilliant, flashing, enfolding love and turn it into something that empowers and transforms us. It is the fullness of life. The gift, this gift of love. John talks about it all the time. That 
that we may know the fullness of his love, the fullness of his presence, the fullness of his being. And Paul talks about in other parts of scripture that the eventual goal is that all things will be brought into Christ, into the fullness of God. This is, this is the ultimate goal. This is the goal of the Passover is to bring his people not just out of slavery and not just um, uh, across death and into his presence, but into the fullness experience of the fullness of God. We are rescued to enter that. To know the oneness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which then makes us one with the body. That's what Paul's talking about today. He's talking about the power of the Holy Spirit to crack our hearts open and the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen and to heal and to deliver and, and, and the power and the job of the Holy Spirit to shed abroad the love of Christ in our hearts, to pour into our hearts the love of God, to get rid of the stuff that makes it hard for the love of God to, to flow in and to fill us over and over with the love of, of God until it overflows. And he does this to us all the time, doesn't he? Crack, fill, crack, fill, <laughs> crack, fill. So, beloved, my prayer for you today, let's bow our heads in prayer. I want to pray a blessing of this passage on you. May you have a Passover moment in the days and weeks ahead when God rescues you from your enemy and when God rescues you from the lies of the enemy, when God rescues you because he delights in you. May whatever difficulty or suffering you are undergoing be sufficient to crack your whole heart open like a coconut so that the Holy Spirit can pour into you the brilliant, flashing, joyful, powerful love of Christ and so that you may be filled with the fullness of God.